Today's conversations will be guided by Rit Agarwala, who is the principal author behind the Rebooting Report. But Rit has tremendous experience in thinking strategically about the future of New York City. In addition to writing the Hub's report, Rit was also the chief architect behind the Plan Y SEEP project, which was the first major climate plan in a megacity. Rit is also known for having been the director of long-term planning and sustainability for New York City under Mayor Bloomberg. Subsequently, he has led the environmental grant making program for Bloomberg Philanthropies and was part of the founding team of Sidewalk Labs where he's led sustainability and mobility. Cornell Tech is also pleased that Ritt has joined our team as a senior fellow at the Urban Tech Hub as of December 2020. So please join me in giving a, more, a warm welcome to Ritt Agarwala. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry and Nika, and thank you all for, uh, for being here this morning and logging in online. I'm, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share with you the work that we've done uh, here at the Urban Tech Hub, thinking very directly about New York City and how technology might be applied to our local urban problems. Um, as Nika and, and Jerry mentioned, our, our work has been under the title of Rebooting New York, an Urban Technology Agenda for New York City and the next administration. And of course, when we started this work 11 months ago, that next administration was kind of abstract. It was a, a set of, of highly competitive primaries for both mayor and city council and, and the various borough presidents. Now, of course, we know who those people are going to be, so it becomes much more concrete. And there's an opportunity, in fact, to translate this, we hope, into ideas that can prompt action in the next administration. And the idea was to package some ideas, to do research, to identify what was promising about urban technology, what could be delivered in a relatively near term, and offer it to the transition teams and to the new uh, electeds and staff. It was a big team, and, and while I'm pleased and, and uh, pleased to have been able to lead it, uh, we had a number of people that reflected kind of the breadth of what Cornell Tech here in New York can pull together. Some Cornell Tech alumni, including Mike Bloomberg, um, several Cornell Tech students. I see a couple, uh, Preksha and, and Connor are here. Uh, Becca Lassman was here yesterday. I don't know if she's here now. And, and Vicki Wu, who graduated, and a number of experts from the broader community here in New York. And we're really happy. Uh, about working with all of them and, and the leverage that we've been able to uh, obtain. Our process on this year-long effort has been in three phases. So we started in the spring with what was really an expert-led process. We did 120-some-odd interviews. These were policymakers, technologists, some advocates, people who had that kind of expert perspective on what technology could do, what the city needed, and how the city works to deploy technology. We were conscious of the fact that that was not a complete representation of all New Yorkers, of course. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons that we issued this report in a draft form, very consciously saying, these are initial ideas. We want to take a first stab at what we're hearing, what we might recommend, and then have the time to reach out to a broader set of people to understand the feedback. In fact, one of the things we found in some of our earliest conversations which should be no surprise to people who have done uh, user research, is that if you go up to the average New Yorker and you say, what should the next mayor do with technology? They really generally don't have a good answer. It's an unfair question because that's not something they've spent a lot of time thinking about. But as we all know, if you ask a New Yorker, what do you think about this proposal? They usually can give you some pretty good feedback pretty quickly. And so since the draft was released in May, we've been doing a number of things. We've been, as I, as I said, ensuring input and, and reactions from a broad cross-section of New Yorkers. We've been very happy to work with, uh, with Beta NYC and with the Public Advocates Office and the Manhattan Borough President's Office in an effort called the People's Technology Assembly, which is a, a multi-organization effort to solicit ideas uh, on how New Yorkers want to see technology used. Um, we've promulgated some of idea, our ideas and, uh, through some, some op-eds. We've tested more of our draft ideas, and we've been doing some more research on topics that we did not get to uh, fully address in the report in the spring. 
And we will be working over the remainder of the year, so another six weeks, including incorporating any, any ideas or feedback that come out of today's conversation or your questions into a final report that we hope to release by the end of the year and share with any electeds uh, who would like it. Um, of course, to think about how one might use technology in New York, that's like such a broad question. And so we had to screen, and we screened for practicality. Number one, we wanted to identify how technology could address issues important to many New Yorkers. Maybe not every New Yorker, but many New Yorkers, and not just think about the things that technologists want to see changed in the city. We wanted to look at issues where technology can make a significant difference. You all know that technology, broadly defined, is relevant to basically everything in modern life. But there are areas where technology could be a significant contribution to a change that might not have been possible with technology even five or 10 years ago. Um, we focused on topics on which the city is in control or in the lead. And therefore, for example, we did not talk about transit. Um, public transit, of course, there are huge opportunities to apply technology to transit, but as we know, the MTA is a state organization. That's not something the mayor really has a ton of control over. So we left that out to focus on the things that the mayor, the city council, the borough presidents really have the responsibility and the power uh, to lead on. And we focused on a relatively near term. It's been fun working alongside Anthony uh, Townsend as he's thinking at 10 years and more out. We're thinking about stuff that's only implementable over the next four years in part because as, an, as somebody who's been in city government, it can be really dangerous to allow our elected officials, frankly, to focus too much on the long term because it's an easy substitute for the stuff that they really should be getting done right here, right now, which is often more difficult, often requires more political choice, uh, and often requires more, more money, frankly. And above all, we wanted to avoid tech solutionism. And so one of the hallmarks of the report, as you'll see, is that we try very hard to define the problem we're trying to solve first before we think about the technologies that might be brought to bear to address it. After those 120 interviews and the ones we've done since, a number of observations shaped our recommendations. First is that there are foundations to be laid. <clears throat> Urban technology progress requires reassuring the public on privacy and ensuring that city government can deliver technology solutions. Equity came up over and over again, not just, and, and this is, I think, an interesting observation, not just because of the moral imperative of an equitable society and the equitable distribution of, of technological access, but also because the digital divide is actually one of the things that prevents New York City government from fully embracing technology solutions. Third is kind of the obvious one, but we, we were excited to find a number of examples where there are a number of city services and functions where new technologies can make a significant difference that have not yet been fully uh, empl employed. And then finally, well not finally, engagement. We saw, and in fact, as, as we all know, the last 18 months have been an experiment in doing work remotely. And one of the things we found was one of the benefits was that technology, this forced move to remote technology, actually had significant opportunities or yielded significant opportunities to improve the level of civic engagement, not reduce it, which is something that I think people would have thought only two years ago. And so that was an exciting finding. And then finally <clears throat> is the biggest picture opportunity I think of all, which is that I would argue, and I think we found, New York City, the largest city in the United States, one of maybe five of the most attractive markets worldwide for urban technology, has really punched under its weight in the ability to shape the urban technology offerings that the private sector and technologists are yielding. And we have some ideas for how New York City might actually change that. So we're not just a leader in deploying urban technology, not just a leader in having companies here who do it, but actually shape urban technology. So what were some of our recommendations? We start with foundations, because you have to start with foundations. And we start with the most important foundation of all, which is privacy. We found over and over again that no matter what the technology idea, the first question was around privacy. And the first thing, therefore, that we recommend 
is the enacting of a new law, something that the city council would have to do, regulating how city agencies and private entities gather and share data collected in the public realm, um, and especially to require a warrant for the law enforcement use of data collected outside of law enforcement. Um, and this is really important. There's so much that city government does that's about gathering information about what's going on in city government, and yet the fear of enhancing that capability generally comes down to, well, what if NYPD can use it? What if uh, the data is sold into some massive central database? And so those were two things that we think there's an opportunity to address. We think there's an organizational opportunity within city government. We talk about the elevation of a CT of the chief technology officer to a deputy mayor for technology. Really, the title there is less important than the fundamental fact that currently the several technology organizations within city government are scattered among different parts of the administration, in fact, reporting to different deputy mayors, and that decentralization is a problem that we found. And then there's the continuing challenge of bringing more technology talent into city government. And so we took a leaf from the Obama administration's U.S. Digital Service and proposed a New York City Digital Service as a way to bring people in on a short-term basis to enrich that pool of talent. It's not to say there are not great technologists working for New York City today. It's just that the number of needs for that technology expertise in city government has expanded much faster than the number of technology or technologists in, on the city payroll. The second, kind of, the second section is about uh, building equity, about thinking about the digital divide, um, and that'll actually be our first conversation this morning. One of our observations was we actually have to think more broadly about the digital divide. We've tended over the last several years as it's come to the fore to really think about it as the question of, do you have a laptop? Do you have a broadband connection at home? In fact, what we found is it's much bigger than that. It's in part that you have to be able to participate fully in the digital economy. 15% of New Yorkers do not have a bank account, which means there's probably a big barrier to their making an online purchase. And a large number of New Yorkers, the majority in fact, may have trouble receiving packages. And one of the things we've seen during the internet or during the pandemic is the dramatic increase in the number of reported package thefts. And we think that's going to be an increasing challenge in part because those thefts generally correlate or the, the felt inability to receive a package correlates negatively with income. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a bigger barrier as we go on. And then the other idea in here is actually to build on what the de Blasio administration proposed in the Internet Master Plan and create a broadband development corporation to be in charge of that long-term project of ensuring that everybody in New York City has broadband access from multiple providers. We had several ideas around mobility. Um, two of them here, one is, one is to use technology to bring safety and order to our streets. We all know that New York City's streets are dangerous. They've gotten worse over the course of the pandemic. It's worse for pedestrians, it's worse for cyclists, it's worse for drivers and passengers and vehicles. One of the challenges is, of course, that it's virtually impossible through traditional means to enforce moving violations. Because what do you do if a car is speeding? You're gonna get a police cruiser to go down 3rd Avenue or 4th Avenue in Brooklyn or something at high speed to chase and stop that car? You can't do it, right? But in fact, we know that camera technology works well. Right now, we're using it aggressively, but only in a limited number of areas for speed uh, violations. But there are many more kinds of violations that cameras can uh, can enforce against, and we think this is a big opportunity. It's also an opportunity to manage our curb, less about enforcement and more about actually thinking about what is the right use for our curb? How do we deal with different users? How do we think about the FedEx truck that needs the parking space for only 15 minutes, but at the same time every day? And if we can provide that, then we don't have that double park truck that blocks traffic. And how can we think about dealing with residents and, and workers and others who might have other needs for the curb? Second problem that we identified with mobility is that there are, as we all know, a host of new mobility vehicles out there, ranging from electric bikes, and there was a great story that some of you probably read, and I see Laura Fox was prominently quoted in that article in the Times yesterday, um, about how e-bikes are actually the best-selling electric vehicles on Earth right now. 
right? It's a big deal. And yet there are real questions, whether it's about e-bikes or mopeds or e-scooters, or looking farther afield to vehicles we don't have in New York, small-scale delivery vans that are autonomous, or, or the kinds of autonomous vehicles that are actually designed for cities, designed to be small in scale, designed to go at the kind of 20 mile an hour speeds that are good for urban environments. But there's nowhere for them to be on New York City streets. They shouldn't be on the sidewalks. They're not really compatible with highway vehicles, which is what our travel lanes are designed for. We think the opportunity exists to expand the bike lanes, to make them wider, and to create a class of vehicles that are basically honorary bikes that the city would get to identify. To say that, well, okay, if you've got an e-bike and it's got a speed controller so it can only go 12 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour, that's a speed that's compatible with biking, then maybe that's actually something that could go in this expanded bike lane. It's really important. This can't just be cramming more vehicles into a six foot wide lane that's already insufficient. But in the context of a more aggressive approach to broaden the appeal of bike lanes, to broaden the number of users, uh, we think there's a big opportunity there. It would also put New York City, again, in that influencing role of being able to say to the Zooks's of the world, the Neuros of the world, design your vehicle like this, and then you can use this great network. And that makes those bike lane networks much more relevant to the storekeepers, to the people who are making deliveries that currently tend to think about bike lanes as a zero-sum game that they are losing. In the built environment, there are huge opportunities we found to uh, employ technology to solve problems. One is around sidewalk sheds. Everybody in New York knows that sidewalk sheds are miserable for the built environment. They're miserable for our experience of New York City streets. Roughly half of the sidewalk sheds you encounter are there because of facade inspections. Facade inspections are really important. New York City does them. It's, it's a really great part of our city government. They, they help most of the time prevent us from getting hit by falling uh, masonry from our buildings while we're walking down the street. The problem is they're very expensive. They require putting up scaffolding. It sometimes the scaffolding is up for, on average, the scaffolding is up for a year. And there should be an opportunity to use drones to do this. Now, this is an interesting thing that we found. And it's about the way city agencies, both here in New York and more generally, think about deploying technology. If you ask yourself, here are the things that the current rules require in a facade inspection. Can a drone do them? The answer is no, of course not, because they're designed for a human. You have to think differently. You have to be able to ask yourself, what are the risks we're trying to identify? What's the level of safety standards that we're trying to reach? And how would a different kind of approach do that? And so instead of a manual thing where you might actually imagine a building inspector literally reaching into a crevice, you're actually thinking differently. You're thinking about uh, ultrasound analysis that a drone can do. You're thinking about millimeter accuracy 3D maps that you could do and compare from one month to six months later to see whether there are minute changes. And so we think there's a big opportunity. We think the net result would be to reduce the number of sidewalk sheds by a quarter, which is a significant improvement. Um, and then finally on this one is around building, uh, building into New York City's construction and real estate industries the consistent use of technology. We fall behind because we are not using the kind of 3D imaging and, and um, building information management systems that you could use across the real estate industry and across construction projects. We see an opportunity for the Department of Buildings actually to force all of New York City's construction industries to start aligning simply by requiring their documents to be submitted in an electronic 3D format. And the biggest opportunity then is currently we spot check uh, our permit applications and, and blueprints for safety. They're spot checked. So actually a relatively small percentage of all the building plans submitted to New York City DOB are actually assessed. If, you, uh, if they are submitted through 3D images, you actually could imagine an automated check, kind of like a spell check, that would actually compare a plan to the code. This requires a significant change over time. So this is probably a longer term shift than some of the things we've imagined, but we think it has significant benefits. Digitizing democracy, as I said, there's a huge opportunity. 
to continue the use of technology, both to bring people into government and to get their voices and to get them the services they need. We'll talk later this morning about an idea to create a digital wallet or a digital locker so, it makes it, so we can make it easier for people to apply for benefits um, that they deserve. Because the irony is that using paper technology, oftentimes you're asking New York City's lowest uh, income people who are struggling to keep ends, to make ends meet. And you're asking them to go to the Department of Health to get their birth certificate, pay their $15 and bring it over to HRA to apply for their SNAP benefits. Those are two city agencies that ought to be able to talk to each other and share information. Do so with that person in the loop so that their privacy is respected, but nonetheless reduce friction. Um, we'll talk a little bit later also about ideas we've seen that community boards and other public forums actually engage a lot more people by going virtual. We think that can be further enhanced if they have the right tools. Um, and we think our systems like nyc.gov and 311 all have the opportunity to be brought up to speed. They were state of the art when they were introduced. They haven't really been reinvented to be consistent with the kind of multi-channel approach that state of the art uh, companies are using. Um, and we think that's a big opportunity. And then finally, and we'll talk about this in our, our concluding uh, conversation today, is around future-proofing, positioning New York City to shape that emerging technology. And what we found here is that the people in city government who have the, who are best positioned to understand the implications of technology are in the agencies. But for professional reasons, they tend not to be willing to get ahead of themselves. They tend not to be willing to say, oh, here's how we ought to shape this before it arrives. On the other hand, you have the city council, which is very happy to enact legislation in advance of things, but actually does not have the staff or the expertise to be able to say, here's what autonomous vehicles might really mean for New York City. The way the city council tends to do most of its work, as we know, is through hearings, and, and it's not really their own research. So one of the things we propose is an external body of experts to uh, make recommendations, kind of like what Anthony is doing, to say, here's what's coming down the road, New York City. Here's what's good about this technology for the urban environment. Here's what could be bad. Here's how you might want to craft rules to get ahead of that. We think that would position New York City to shape the field of urban technology and make it serve all New Yorkers. We've done a lot of feedback. We've been working uh, very hard to make sure that we've gotten a wide variety of perspectives. We've learned a number of things that have shaped our report. My colleagues and I who are doing uh, the panels today will interject some of the things that we've found, um, as you can see here. But this kind of input is going to be reflected in our final report, whereas we've said to everybody, we are very open to changing our recommendations in the face of new information.